Okay, so welcome back. Now, this was in case things were actually normally distributed. What if things are not normally distributed? What would you do? I know that in the introduction statistics course, there is one thing that is being taught there. I don't know if you recall, those of you who followed that course. If you, if you don't recall, you can say the link is 02402.compute.dtu.dk. Uh, <laughs> I'll give that hint later. Um, so, you were doing some bootstrapping and other sampling techniques in that course where you could do various things. That's one approach to do what I call a non parametric test. Non parametric in the sense that there's no parameters in the distribution. An alternative is what I call the Wilkinson rank sum test. And the name itself pretty much explains what it's doing. So, rank sum test. What does that mean? You take the sum of the rank, and the ranking means basically you sort all the observations, and then you keep track of whom belong to which group. So, how do we do that? We have the humorous data here. Oops. Now I scrolled too far. So we have all the humorous values here. And then we have a, another column with the codes. If I ask for the order of this, then I get what is the order I need to index with in order to get them in the sorted order. Smallest first and largest at the end. So you can see that we had those that, if you recall from the plot that we have over here, a little bit backwards in time. That was the one I wanted to look at. Here you have those that died in the beginning of the list and those that survived at the end of the list. And you can see the largest ones are at the end of the list, which corresponds very well with the fact that the, the largest five largest numbers are actually the last five observations in the data set. Now, if I use these numbers as indexing, If I compare these numbers, let me just combine these, column binding these numbers with the codes. So then I have the order for each of the observations. This is not what I want to do. What I want to do is I want to take the sum of all these orders for those that have code 1 and the sum for all those that have code 2. So what I want to do is I want to take these orders here, I want to split those according to the code, now I have the two, the ones and the twos, the orders of the ones and the orders of the twos. Recall again that you have the last five are the big ones at the end there, just to have a reference. Also that the first observation is the smallest one, and you can easily see that from the graph as well. That's also the first one there. So now what we need to do is just to calculate the mean value of each of the groups, or the sum, I'll do it in a fancy way. I will explain that later what it does. 
Anyone who have seen who has not seen the S apply before? Who has not seen only a few of you? Okay. So the apply function, what they do is rather than making a formal for loop to go true for each value of things. Now there's only two, I could just write it as two statements. But what it does is that it takes, in this case, what comes out of the split command here is a list with two elements. Each element is a vector of those orders that belong to the one group and the other group. And then it takes and does the same thing. It applies that function out there to each element of that group. So just take the sum for each element of that of groups. So those are the sum of the orders there. How do I then test if it's significant or not? I have to subtract the mean value of the order, but rather than doing everything manually, I will just run a code that does that. The test statistic there is this number up here minus the expected value. And we get a p-value in this case of 17%. Well, what I wanted to just show you is it, you're just doing the sum of the orders. So what happens if I make a log transformation of the data? Will that change anything? If I make a monotone function of all the observations, and do the same thing. Will that change anything? I think this is the time to take chess that everyone is awake. The way I do that is I am the choir director and you say either yes or no, depending on what the right answer is. And I say one, two, three, and then it comes. One, two, three. I heard kind of an echo with different answers. Um, so. The answer is, it does not change anything. If you take the log of the number, the ordering is the same. Let's just try it. Exactly the same rank statistic, the ordering is exactly the same. And that's the uh, take-home part there. So, to get back, we could not, and even though we did here, if we did this with the greater than, let me remove the log again. Here I can also have the alternative to be greater. But now I flip the order, so it should be less. Sorry for that. Um, so in this case, we cannot prove significant difference in either way. So, and this is typically the case, not always the case, but most often the non-parametric test has a larger p-value than the parametric test. So if it is appropriate to do a parametric test, it, te it tends to be stronger in the sense that it can more often prove a difference that is there. Okay. So if data are not normally distributed, I said this already, do a transformation so that you can assume that things are normally distributed. What are the typical transformations? I mentioned one. The logarithm, of course, it depends a lot on what the data you have, how they are behaved. So when doing transformations, there's one thing to be aware of. Why do you do transformations? What do a transformation do to your data? Yes. Yes. 
Yes, I agree with everything you say. Um, if you look from a more mathematical perspective, yes. It's not about being easy, it's about fulfillment of assumptions. So if you have log normally distributed data, if you take the log of that, it's normal, which means that the assumption of normality is fulfilled, which means it's appropriate to do the t-test, whereas the alternative would be to do, say, a non-parametric test that is not as strong. So, so that's one thing, but uh, maybe I should discuss this further in detail tomorrow as well. Um, but it is about getting an appropriate scale for all the observations. It's a matter of whether the uncertainty of an observation is that always the same or does it depend on the value? But I'll, I think I'll say it tomorrow because there's an appropriate time to say it there as well. Of course, the alternative is to do a non parametric test that always works. I showed you the Wilkinson Ransom test. There's also the Kolmogorov Smirnov test, ks.test in R, um, as an alternative. The Wilkinson test only works with two groups, the other one works with multiple groups. The idea is the same, it's a rank sum test. You can easily have more than one group, or more than two groups. You just do the same, you do the ordering, and then you sum the scores or the orders within each group. Done. So, another example, looking at assumptions. So. A control experiment, some places like this, can you actually seed clouds and thereby get more rainfall? Can you put some crystals into the atmosphere that will give you some condensation and thereby get some rainfall? And that's one place where you could say data is not upfront looking as nice as we wanted it to be, but let's just Look at how it works. I'll read the rainfall data. Again, I'll just do a summary of what we have here. Again, we have a code. In this case, the median is 1.5. What does that actually mean? How many ones and how many twos are there? When I tell you that the rain has in total 52 observations. Sorry? Yeah, there's an equal number of ones and twos. Yes, there's the same number of ones and twos. Because otherwise the median would be either one or two. Now, the code, I want to have it as a factor variable because it's actually not meant to be used as a numeric. It's meant to be used as a label for the two different treatments. And then I'll do what is called a box plot just to show you what happens in one group and the other group. And do you know what happens in a box plot? Can you explain? What is this box plot showing? What does the different horizontal lines represent in a box plot? Or is it too early in January? Yes? Yeah, what I actually ask is, is, is you are already starting to explain what happens there, but what I want to know first is what is actually in a box plot. So, yes? So what, what, the median is the thick line there. What is in the outer width of the box here? Yes, so the 25% to 75% percent quantiles, also called the quartiles, or the inner quartile range. And then we have the so-called whiskers out here. What do they do? Is it the maximum or minimum observation? Yes, it, I mean, 
ideally, yes, you're right, it is the maximum or minimum. Uh, indeed, it is the minimum, but it's not the maximum. So what is then displayed as the top whisker? When it's not the maximum as we would want it to be, I fully agree with that. So the idea here is that we want to detect for outliers, which means if you just went to the maximum, well, we need to measure uh, when do we consider things an outlier. If we look at the help for our box plot, there is a range option that determines how far the plot whiskers extend out from the box. If the range is positive, the whiskers extend to the most extreme data point, which is no more than range times the inner quarter range from the box. If we pick zero, it will go to the maximum, always. Now the default value is 1.5. So that means when the maximum value is more than 1.5 times the inner quartile range away from the upper or lower quartile, then the last point inside that range will be used as the extent of the whisker, and everything beyond will just be marked as observations. So this means that there is some skewness in the data. If we do a QQ plot for one of the groups, we can also see that here we have a large departure from normality up here at the large end. It's not nice at all. If we just plot the data, again we have the one group and then the other group, but just showing the data. It's kind of, what is that we see? We see that when we have many observations with small values and a few observations with large values, and it seems that they are further apart. So it seems like the variance is larger when you have larger observations. So what we want it to be is that we want to have the same variance for all observations. One way to do that is to do the lock I could also just say it's a log axis. But now if we do it like this, you can see that we have some much more homogeneous variants. There is a problem down here, and that's like due to something different. It goes down to zero. Now we get down to the point where the observations, when we look at rain, only at one decimal point. So the numerical precision is not good enough to separate things down here. That's one of the reasons down here. That is a one, the one there, that gives you the logarithm of that is zero, and, and then it jumps up to some discrete values up here. So there are some discrete jumps due to the measuring technique and the precision. So that's uh, just how life is. But a lock, if we do the box plot on a lock scale, now again, you can say this point and those two observations over there sticks out. But what you should notice is that the median is nicely in the center of the inner quartile range as opposed to before. I mean, it could always be nicer if that's what you <laughs> are saying. But we also still have some fairly small samples, so it's not too bad. And if you do the QQ plot for the log transform data, we see that everything stays within the 95% here. Ah, it doesn't quite hold for the other one. So the group two has a little bit too heavy, too large 
small numbers. <laughs> I mean, they're too small. The t that's lower tail there. So it's not perfect, but it's one of those cases where, well, if we test for normality, we get a p-value that is fairly large, which means we cannot reject that it's normal. And even for the second one here, that where the QQ plot is not fine, we cannot reject that it's normal. One of the reasons is that the Shapiro test the power, as in how efficient is it at detecting non-normality, is not that great when we have these 26 observations. We need many more observations before it actually starts to pick up power. So if I do the variance test comparing the two groups, the ratio of the variance is, is 1.05. So it's almost the same, only 5% difference. And the confidence interval for that covers one, so we're happy, which also is in correspondence with the p-value that is very, very high. Rather than always subsetting those that belong to one group and those that belong to the other group, there is this formula version of things. We take the log of the rain not rain, dollar rain, not taking the column, but just saying the name of the column in here, till the, the code, and then I say I take the data from the data frame that is called rain. I know here there's two names that are clashing, um, but this is out here is the data frame with all the numbers in here, and those two here in the formula here, those are the column names in the data frame. This gives me the same, it's just code-wise, it's much easier when you get to know it. And I can do the t-test. Now we tested that normality is sufficiently okay, and we tested that the variances are equal, I mean, not different, sorry. Um, and then I can do the t-test, and what is the conclusion? we get a p-value of 1.4%. So it's quite significant, this difference. And the means in the two groups are 4 and 5.1 on the log scale. So what does that mean on the original scale? A difference in 1 on a log scale, what does that mean on the original scale? Sorry? Now, now I use the natural logarithm, not the base 10. <laughs> but you're almost right. <laughs> so it's a factor of E to 2.7-ish. Oh, now that number's a bit greater than 5, so roughly three times more rain when you seed the clouds relative to not seeding the clouds. Again, I can also do the rank sum test. In this case, the p-value is actually around the same, um, but and again here I can also do it with and without transforming the data, it works. The last bit here is just how to make a plot and save it. These are plots I made before, if I do it for the transformed it like that. If I want to make a PDF file with all those graphs in them, I just specify the PDF file in the beginning and the size of that. And then when I say I want to close that file, right now I'm plotting to a file, I'm not plotting to the screen. When I close that device, it returns to my standard device, graphic device, to be the, sc the screen over here. And now I should have a file. What did I name it? Test.pdf. So I have this file, that being the first page, and then I have the subsequent plots on the following pages. just to have that as an example. One thing I 
always do is I, the default gives you quite a lot of space out here in the margins. So what I tend to always do is to trim the margins away from the default. I actually probably already did it here. Um, because I, I always do this. So now I'll just remove all my plots and then I will plot this graph with the rain. Um, so here's the default white space around it. And I find that as I like to see the plot rather than to see white space around it. So what I do is, if you look at the parameters, it's a long list. The default is to place the axis text down here, the label, three lines out and the numbers one line out and the ticks, I mean zero lines out. What I tend to do is just to make that 2.8 and zero lines out and I should probably do that in two steps. So if I just change this one here first and then replot the whole thing, what the only thing that did different was to move the text closer, but now I have a lot of white space around everywhere. And that's the margin that I'm playing with. I forgot what the default is, but I tend to use around tree. And then, so what the margins here are, first one is below, then to the left, then at the top and at the right. At the top, I mean, this is a matter of style. Some like to have a title in the plot and some like not to have it. When I'm showing it here, it's nice to have it, but when you include it in a report, I tend to say, well, you typically don't have a title on the plot. You have a caption explaining what is in the plot. But again, that's a matter of style. Um, so usually I would just put that to one. But in this case, since I have a, a title in the plot or a main text, it gets a little bit too crammed up there. So I will just increase it a little bit. So that's one of the small tweaks and there's a lot of different parameters you can play with. Um, I find those to be the ones that kind of makes everything a little bit nicer. Um, but every time you clear your plotting device, you have to reset it. But the list of parameters, if you just call par, then you can get a, a list of all the different things you can play with. Uh, and don't play with everything. But I mean, colors and X logarithm and whatever, rather than doing this, you should probably look at the help for the par. What, what I do to do that is when I'm in here, in a, when I'm in a function, I hit the tab key to show me what are the options that I can pick here. Pa, and then the what is this purple color at the top? Those are the ones that are you can say arguments for this function. The pa function just have a dot dot dot, which means you can give it anything. But then it also says here in the small bottom of the yellow box there, hit F1 for additional help. So here you can find the help function including explanation of all the different things. So if you have an idea of what you're asking and what you're looking for, go in there and then there's a find in topic here. Search for markings or whatever. There's a lot of things you can play with. I will try to play with some, but not everything. Just those that I find are the most essential. This was what I planned to do this morning. And as for exercises, let me see if I can get back to the other PDF. I couldn't. No, that's not. Oh, whatever. So I made a quite a long list of things to do 
today. The plan is that at one o'clock I will give you another short lecture. So right now you are able to do the first four. I would say if you are quite familiar with R, skip the first one and do the body fat, the calcium and the women in labor force exercises. Then I will show the results for the first one when we get to that. Um, and then if you're quick and get into the afternoon, when we get there, just so I remember saying it, the last one there, please remind me to come with a hint for that before ending the lecture, otherwise it's a little bit out of reach. Just because you have to think a little bit further. It's not that it's super difficult, but coding-wise it's a little bit more tricky. So, any questions? I do expect two TAs, at least one, to show up any minute now um, to help during the first week here. But during the second and third week, it will just be me because I want everyone to have the same help. Also, last year we experienced that having TAs there that says something different than what I would have said to a particular question. And then you are at the all exam and they said, but the TA said this, but said yes, but it's wrong. That is a situation I do not like to be in. So the way we do it there is that, first of all, I think we all know that we learn the most by solving problems ourselves. Sometimes we just get too stuck to move on and then we need help. So I'm trying to make the different the projects there so wide that you have different things that you can work on. So even though if you have one problem somewhere, you can continue elsewhere. And then it will be such that each group will have each group will have 50 minutes of help each day. So rather than running around who is on the list, who's handing up, who's best at asking questions and so forth, the way it will be is that I will come and sit with each group for 15 minutes each day. We'll make a booking schedule for that so that everyone has 15 minutes. Write down your questions so that you're efficient because that's your time. I'm a bit worn after a day like that, but I think that's the way you gain the most. And of course, feel free, maybe not of course, but feel free to talk with other groups. The group forming, I'll get more details on that on, on Thursday when we'll actually start doing it, but it's nice for you to get to start thinking of that right now. Groups of three students. I think in this room, it's quite easy to do because you can easily sit three at each table. So if you start forming groups by the way that you're sitting, even the first group, first few days here, that also leaves a spare chair for me to sit at when I'm around, uh, which is nice. So start forming groups on your own. When we get to it, there's one, only one rule. At the end of the day, besides there has to be three in each group as a starting point. And the other rule is there's no group that is fixed until that everyone who wants to be a member of a group is a member of a group. I may do a few exceptions for the first rule, not for the second rule. But I'll repeat that on Thursday, but it's a good time to start figuring out whom will I team up with. Maybe move around a little bit if you don't know whom you're going to work with already. During the, the first few days here, shove around, see what happens. Any questions?